Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Tonight podcast. I'm the host of the episode, Joe Carson, Chief Security Scientist and Advisory CISO at Delinea. And today we've got a very special episode, which is going to be really fantastic. I'm really excited. There's a very special thing is that this is episode 100. Um, so we've now had 100 episodes over a long time. Um, and it's pretty impressive. And we've also passed over 300,000 listeners, which is impressive as well. So out of all of our episodes, we've had over 300,000 listeners of episodes. So a really great achievement. I'm really excited to, to hit this milestone. And for that, I'm joined with a really fantastic person I've got to see speak many times in the past, and a really a pleasure to spend the time uh, on today's episode with. So welcome to the show, Kieran Martin. So Kieran, do you want to give us a bit of a background to you know who you are, what you do, and some fun things about yourself? Well, thanks very much for having me, Joe. Thank you, um, not just for having me, but congratulations on your 100th episode. <laughs> Fantastic achievement. So I'm Kieran Martin. I'm based in the UK. I'm originally from Northern Ireland, not far from you. And <laughs> I was the founding chief executive of the UK National Cybersecurity Centre. So I spent seven years, roughly, just short of that, mm -hmm. um, at GCHQ in the UK, <clears throat> Firstly, setting up and then running the National Cybersecurity Centre for uh, four years. I stepped down in the end of, or towards the end of 2020, um, with a bit of a slightly extended tenure to cope with uh, pan the pandemic. Really interesting, actually, <laughs> working in a high security but also um, mixed classification environment during uh, co during the sort of ravages of um, mm -hmm. COVID and the sudden move to home working and so forth. And for the last three and a half years, I've been teaching government and cybersecurity at the University of Oxford and working with a bunch of cybersecurity companies and writing and doing some charity work and doing podcasts and stuff like that. So brilliant to be here. And um, hello to Estonia. Yep, fantastic. That's excellent. It's really great uh, to hear. Kind of, it's impressive. One of the things I always kind of curious about, you know, uh, do, did you have a cybersecurity background? Uh, what was what was your background? How did you oh, get God, into no. the industry? No. So one of my rules in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. my, my, my number one, in fact, my probably only rule for survival is don't pretend you have expertise that you don't have. Mm -hmm. you know, cybersecurity is a discipline of many different varieties. There's core technical stuff and there's very general uh, stuff. And you know, I honestly argued against my own appointment. Um, I owed my <laughs> uh, senior job at GCHQ to, I owed my senior job at GCHQ, mm -hmm. and I'm not making this up, to Edward Snowden because I'd worked with the intelligence agencies before on sort of legal mm -hmm. and political crises, mostly the human intelligence agencies in the UK who got caught up in a bunch of, you know, quite serious challenges, legal, political mm -hmm. challenges around um, uh, alleged torture and uh, alleged complicity in torture and mm -hmm. rendition um, of Guantanamo and other uh, detainees during the um, post 9-11 uh, uh, mm -hmm. period and what the Americans uh, may or may not have been uh, doing. So I had quite a lot of experience in that sort of interface between national security and the law and politics mm -hmm. and um, the constitution and so forth. So then all of a sudden Snowden hit GCHQ and GCHQ had largely been immunized from these other uh, developments. It didn't really have any experience and really have a policy department sort of communications mm -hmm. and outreach didn't wasn't really used to explaining what it did so i went off to do that but as with all sort of crises you're kind of there or with the exception perhaps of covid you're sort mm -hmm. of um you either succeed or fail within six months so as well what's the long-term plan for me here mm -hmm. and they said well you could run cybersecurity. security want to step up our mission i said but i don't know anything about it in fact i went back to northern ireland um at christmas that year and told one of my oldest friends somebody i've known for <laughs> since i was four so 40 years at that point uh, nearly 35 to 40 years at that point and said you know i might take up this role in cybersecurity." and he said but what do you know about computers I spent my first year, as well as the Snowden stuff, just really getting to learn the subject, but listening to the technical mm -hmm. experts. I was blessed with some fantastic technical experts, people who went on to play major roles in the development of the NCSC. Mm -hmm. And they said, look, you know, if you want to get a strategic backing, political backing, you know, money to do things that we could really do we've got some brilliant ideas but nobody's listening so the job was to sort of build a partnership with them and in a sense the ncc was a deal between me and the technical experts mm -hmm. to you know bring the sort of general you know, gchq's cybersecurity experts were amongst the best in the world and getting people of that quality of, um, mm -hmm. and that technical expertise to work for government wages was miraculous, um, but they really were driven by a sense of um, mission, but they were doing it very much behind the wire, behind barbed wire in an organization with no 
mobile phones, for example. So mm -hmm. how could you advise businesses or civilian bits of government, you know, dealing with huge payment systems, for example, how mm -hmm. could you advise them on cybersecurity when you couldn't literally pick up the phone to them or they couldn't pick up the phone to you? you couldn't mm -hmm. even access them by normal email. We thought we better change all of this. So my background, long-winded answer, my background was not in cybersecurity at all. I had to learn it from, from, from scratch. I've since developed quite a lot of expertise not so much technical but if you know someone mm -hmm. says to me there's been a major ip theft from a british university i probably will predict pretty accurately who that was if they say well so and so was mm -hmm. locked out of a healthcare network in the united states i can probably predict who that was and so forth um but mm -hmm. you know my back i did not have a deep technical background and i think sometimes for me i sometimes think that sometimes the best thing is because it allows you to come in with kind of you know rather than a a single point of view, it allows you to come in with much more policy base. And I think one of the things we've always been missing in cybersecurity industry is we've got a lot of great people with those technical skills, but we didn't have a lot of people with great communication and great understanding of policy based skills. And I think that's always a great thing to have people coming in that and bring that into the industry to help us communicate better, to help us be able to put things in what it means for the business or what it means for citizens. Or So I think for me, sometimes not having the skills, it doesn't mean you can't do the job. It just means you have to surround yourself with great people who have the skills, but you become that interface. You become the translator uh, to how that converts into either policy or communications or best practices. So I think that's always a great thing. And, and having people you know, coming into the industry that might have had a different background, sometimes in service, sometimes in, in communication or even marketing. Uh, can really change the way we do in the industry. So I think that's a great thing. I think you need both. One of the things so I'd like to kind of go backing on myself. Yep. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I think you need both. So slightly double backing on myself. I think if you um, think about so the first full year of the NCSC's operation, loads of people were really interested in it. We had 55 different countries come to see it. And so you got kind of used mm -hmm. to hosting all these senior people. We had the then Prime Minister of Estonia, as I recall. And a lot of them would say, can we see your comms team? I would say, sure, of course you can meet the comms team, but can I ask why? He said, well, really impressed with the way you give accessible, user-friendly advice. I said, yeah, but what's it based on? You know, one of the things in, mm -hmm. before in uh, the NCSC in the UK, we had two organizations dealing with cybersecurity, with GCHQ dealing with deeply technical, mostly secret stuff and not communicating it to anybody. And we had the mm -hmm. CERT, which was the other way around. It was very good at communicating yep. an outreach to the business community and to the rest of government and to the ordinary citizen, but didn't mm -hmm. have specific expertise. It wasn't didn't have much that you couldn't get from the commercial sector. So it's putting those two things together. And you're right about communications. I mean, something, the, the very best um, sort of cybersecurity professional, somebody with technical skills and brilliant communication mm -hmm. skills, but they're as rare as hen's teeth. I was blessed that Ian Levy, yep. Dr. Ian Levy, the technical director was one such person. That was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the reasons he was so good was that he was a um, cybersecurity um, you know, genius uh, who could also communicate uh, highly effectively. Did all, it didn't always um, uh, run smoothly. You know, you do take your risks with that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And there was a fantastic <laughs> moment where Ian... You'd have thought um, you know, he would go all over the world convincing people, you know, persuading them, building these hugely mm -hmm. powerful partnerships. But I recall once he went to Australia and made a speech where he said, and this was core NCSC philosophy, he said, you know, you don't mm -hmm. need to block all cyber attacks. You just need to make yourself a little bit of a harder target. So he said in his own inimitable way, mm -hmm. my job is not to stop cyber crime in the UK. My job is to send it to France, forgetting that in the digital age, <laughs> these things don't really stay in Australia. They get back to France within like a minute. And so I had a rather amused mm -hmm. at, and thankfully very uh, mature <laughs> uh, teasing from Guillaume Poupard, my French counterpart, uh, rather than any more serious diplomatic incident. Yep. <laughs> That's actually very funny. So one of the things I'd like, you know, I, I had recently on Tanel Sepp, who's the uh, Estonian cyber ambassador uh, on the show. And one of the things that he brought up, uh, which was really interesting, was that, you know, for many years, governments didn't really take cybersecurity that seriously. Uh, they may have had it as you know important part of the you know uh, within, uh, but not from a national cybersecurity perspective. And in Estonia, it didn't become important or really that visible for the government until it was around 2007 when they had the uh, state-sponsored cyber attack uh, from Russia to Estonia. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned the Snowden side. Um, so when when did it become what, what was what what existed before the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK and and uh, what was you know different? You, you mentioned that there was a cert, there was GCQ. Uh, what was there before, 
And then kind of what was the kind of trigger point to to bring it together? As you mentioned, the need to have something, uh, a, 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 an agency or a service that provided best practices and communication to businesses and citizens. Uh, what was the kind of driving point? What was before and, and, and what was kind of uh, bringing it together? What was that look like? Well, perhaps happily, we didn't have the forcing function of the devastating attack as Estonia did in 2007, mm -hmm. which really was an outlier. And it's hard to think of another country that suffered such mm -hmm. a sustained onslaught on critical functions that early. <clears throat> Indeed, I think, you know, had Estonia happened mm -hmm. five certainly 10 years later there would have been much more serious repercussions because people the international mm -hmm. community understood that sort of thing much better in say 2017 than it did in 2007 2007 it was like what's going on here yep. and so forth and i think that sort yeah. of speaks to i mean speaking <clears throat> speaking to the uk experience there are probably three phases and i think the us and many european countries mm -hmm. are broadly many western european countries are broadly similar in this so there's phase one which is until in the uk's experience until about 2009 um mm -hmm. Uh, slightly earlier in the US where you just didn't care at all. You didn't have a policy, you didn't have a strategy, nobody was responsible mm -hmm. for it apart from, you know, a few enthusiasts in different military or security mm -hmm. organizations. That's 2009. <clears throat> the UK had a a, a short um, uh, cybersecurity strategy in 2009 with the princely sum of five million pounds, roughly, you know, six million euro allocated to it. <laughs> um, so we're not really reflecting a sort of fairly low uh, prioritization. And I think mm -hmm. phase um, so phase two would have begun in the UK. It was a much more serious strategy in 2011 with more money attached to it. Um, but even then, I mm -hmm. think phase two sort of 2009 to the mid to the mid teens. And I think that phase is sort mm -hmm. of characterised by what you might call interested inertia, uh, or you know, active inertia, mm -hmm. because we were doing. You know, There's a lot of talk about it. There were strategies and so forth. But actually, the strategies in both the UK and the US and lots of other places were. Let's force the. Let's tell. Let's shout at the private sector and tell them to share information. Do you remember information sharing? And it was years before we, <laughs> you know, in in our field, we started to call information sharing mm -hmm. the hopes and prayers of the cybersecurity industry. Um, and let's do public private partnerships without specifying what they were. Mm -hmm. Um, you asked then. So the third phase I would date from sort of 2015, and then the NCC comes mm -hmm. in in 2016. And there were a bunch of long forgotten political circumstances that um, drove that. There was this brief period, uh, largely forgotten now in the UK, between the general election of um, May 2015 and the Brexit referendum mm -hmm. of June 2016. So a 13 month period where the Conservatives had won unexpectedly a small overall majority. Um, there was a finance minister, a chancellor, as we call it, called George Osborne. He was very interested mm -hmm. in cybersecurity. He was assumed to be David Cameron's successor. And they were in a position of real strength until they lost the referendum. Mm -hmm. And they decided that the cybersecurity um, strategies that they'd been pursuing were failing and they wanted new ideas. So we were in this happy position where we had strong political sponsorship. Cybersecurity was uh, strategically important, but not partisanly mm -hmm. contentious issue. You know, I mean, basically one of the things I was blessed with for most of my time in government and cybersecurity was that, you know, the only thing people cared about was, was whether you're any good or not, you know, um, Healthcare in the UK is very ideologically split, so is education, so are lots of other things. But cybersecurity, there's no real fault line in it, so it was the government wants to do a bit more. Have you got any good ideas? Will you do it well? And people would criticise you if you didn't do it well, but not for other things. So I was, you know, and I think the politics of this mattered for, you know, despite the huge convulsions politically in the UK of the, of, of the remainder of that decade. And it was for those um, <laughs> unfortunate enough to follow British politics, you know, it was a pretty juicy period, um, not marked for stability. I remember, uh, fact, I remember it well. <laughs> so. But throughout those years, remarkably, I had a stable strategy. It wasn't one of those strategies that kept being re rewritten every year. I had strong political sponsorship because I ended up serving um, three Conservative Prime Ministers in, in short order, um, Cameron uh, May for most of the time, and then Johnson. Um, um, decent amounts of uh, funding. And I think, importantly, a right uh, the right balance between political backing and operational autonomy. So I remember when WannaCry hit mm -hmm. in 2017, and WannaCry, just by bad luck, hit the UK quite hard. And also, by worse luck, mm -hmm. hit the health service more than other sectors. It was in the middle of a general election campaign. And again, for those who follow British politics, you know, 
the health service and an election campaign is pretty sensitive stuff. But I remember, you know, talking to 10 Downing Street over the course of that fateful weekend in May 2017 and saying, look, we might need to do this, that, the other. We might need to go on TV. We might need to issue this guidance, mm -hmm. etc." And they just said, go and do it. That's what we set you up to do. We trust your judgment. We're not in a sense, we're not in a, any position to second guess you. That's perfect. You know, it's give us strong political backing, but don't interfere in the operation. So we were very, very blessed. Um, with um, actually the strong support of the governing system. And that actually really matters if you're trying mm -hmm. to do anything in government on cybersecurity or anything else for that matter. Yeah, I think that's vital as well as they get, they get the support to be able to go and, and, and make things happen. Um, the, definitely the, the WannaCry and NotPetya were two massive significant uh, impacts to the industry, not only uh, was, uh, you know, with the healthcare, but also on supply chain as well. And then it really, that show as well is not just about the impact that it has on individual countries, but also the impact that it has basically across multiple countries and through supply chains as well that uh, that really indicated that you know the the country borders in the digital space were no longer really there um and that that meant cooperation yeah. and transparency and working together became very very important and that i think the not petcha side really triggered not only you know where you know the want cry triggered the need to do something but not petcha you know, triggered the need to cooperate and work together as governments. I think that was a, a pivotal moment. I think that's right. And that was, you know, looking back on the period and, you know, I was appointed in December 2013. I left at the mm -hmm. very end of August 2020. And that whole you know, nearly seven year period, um, that NotPetya, uh, WannaCry sort of six week period and the weeks around it mm -hmm. were the most difficult. And the reason they were most difficult wasn't just because they were the two biggest incidents that affected the UK in my time. You could make cases that there were other, you know, very big incidents. Mm. Um, they were very close together. They had, you know, significant ramifications for the UK. But what I think made them um, very, uh, what makes them so sort of memorable in a bad way, um, uh, two mm. things. One is they were both accidents. I mean, not 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 complete accidents in that, you know, they were <laughs> maliciously started, but both went way beyond the intent of their um, most most went way beyond the intent of those behind them. So North Korea was clearly on a spree of stealing mm -hmm. more cash from financial institutions and wrote this terrible yep. worm that just went all over the place in ways that, you know, until Marcus Hutchins heroically sinkholed it, you know, it was it was going mad all over the world. Not Petya, you know, I don't think you I don't think you're being nice or appeasing of the Russian state to say that you know Cadbury's <laughs> chocolate making plant in Tasmania, Australia was not its target when it went for Ukrainian tax software. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it was that accidental, you know, frankly, in both of those cases, if the mm -hmm. attackers, if the aggressors had been better at their jobs, we would have had less damage. And I think that sort of collective vulnerability that mm -hmm. you spoke of um, was really damaging. And the second and related thing was, you know, we talk about what's the impact of cyber attacks and certainly, you know, I mean, in, in in both those cases, I mean, nobody thinks anybody died, although when you start messing with healthcare systems, you never know what, quite what the long term consequences are going to be. There was clearly significant economic damage, but we were just also jumpy. I remember a few weeks after Not Petty, so mm -hmm. WannaCry was what, May, Not Petty was June. And I remember at some point in July, mm -hmm. children were younger then, and I was at some kid's birthday party in a nearby village. Um, and uh, number 10 phoned, and they said, What are we going to do about Heathrow? Have you got a sit rep on Heathrow? I said, what are you talking about? What's going on at Heathrow? And um, they said, well, you know, there's all these cues because there's a major cyber attack on BA at Terminal 5. And so I called mm -hmm. BA because by then, because of other issues, we had a good operational relationship. And they said, look, this is just an IT outage. You know, <laughs> send your guys in, but we'll check. We can prove. <laughs> and we did. And it was late IT failure. And what was really interesting about that was just, you know, and I was pleased that number 10 were interested in watching and so forth. But, you know, not Petty and WannaCry had sowed this fear that your that our way of life, you know, mm -hmm. our sort of essential, normal, everyday life could be just so easily disrupted that actually when you're bog standard IT outage, which, you know, let's be realistic, these things happen, you know, running yep. big IT networks is hard and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's this automatic assumption that this must have been malicious. Turns out it was just another IT failure. Um so I think that's sort of pernicious. You talked about Estonia in 2007. Mm -hmm. You talked to Ukrainians, you know, 
just before the war, the cognitive impact, the destabilizing mm-hmm. psychological menace of cyber attacks is really quite yep. disturbing. You talk to Australians when, you know, their medical details were um, uh, were threatened with being leaked and so forth after the mm-hmm. uh, Medibank um, uh, uh, attack. I think we sometimes understate just that how pernicious, not just economically, but psychologically uh, cyber operations can be. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the big, big things for me is that, yeah, we always look at the financial side. And also then we look at, you know, the mental impact on those victims is, you know, it's sometimes when you look at a financial impact, I've always, always heard, you know, and one of the most common things is that it's easier to get your money back from a cyber attack than it is to get your, you know, your identity back. If your identity is stolen, then it can be abused quite significantly into many other things. Um, and then also, you know, your most sensitive details, if you look at the Bastema case in Finland, where it was about basically psych- psychological, you know, uh, psychiatrist notes that got basically uh, disclosed. Some of the most sensitive things you don't even tell your children or partner or anyone else. You're telling a psychiatrist uh, on getting those details out. Um, you know, there's a lot of really kind of mental and, and psychological impact to the victims. And I think it's, you know, and even to the point where even some of the more recent texts, you know, where it ha- even has life threatening um, impact. I remember one of my roles many, many years ago. Uh, was responsible for the Northern, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. And when my systems weren't working, people died. And that's one of the things you have to realize. And we're yeah. now into that point where the systems are so dependent on technology and connectivity is that when they're out for a sustained amount of time, that, yes, there is inadvertent and indirect impact on people, whether it being the mental side or, or even you know, uh, threatening people's lives. And we're starting to see some, you know, were, I think it was one of the ransomware cases in Germany that happened just a few years ago, where a patient was en route to a hospital and had to be diverted and ultimately basically wasn't able to get the treatment they needed. So we're starting to see that kind of massive impacts on the outcome. And I think this is where really, where we're really starting to, to not just look at the financial impact of, of cyber attacks, but, but the human impact. Um, I think that makes a big difference. So I think that's right. I mean, that Finnish case you mentioned, the mental health uh, organization, mm-hmm. I mean, the Finnish case was just absolutely revolting. And you want uh, if you want to sort of guide to how unscrupulous and amoral mm-hmm. cyber attackers are, then there you go. Yeah. I think on the other point about you know, dependence, critical systems dependence on, mm-hmm. on IT, um, I think we need to understand this a bit better because when actual sort of life and limb is at stake, we're actually quite good. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, when we started worrying about cyber, when people started talking about cyber Pearl Harbors and cyber 911s and all the stuff that we now basically, mm-hmm. I think, correctly think is nonsense. Yeah. People said, well, you can bring planes out of the sky and so forth, which actually you can't really. So, yeah. you know, by way of illustration, um, another accidental IT failure this summer, last summer now, um, in the summer of 2023 mm-hmm. in the UK, um, the National Air Traffic System uh, computer fails. Now, at that it wasn't a cyber attack, but let's say if it had been a cyber attack, it would have been exactly the same because it mm-hmm. failed accidentally. I think people knew that there'd be a backup system. You could land them essentially using radio. People might, you know, planes yeah. might be delayed. There might be major economic disruption and lots of annoyed people mm-hmm. who are in the wrong place, um, um, you know, or, or massively delayed or whatever and miss their key meetings or mm-hmm. miss their family wedding or whatever it is. Uh, so it's not pleasant, but nobody's at risk of injury or death, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we're good at that when it's a critical system. Similarly, you know, you can hack a railway signaling system, but the trains will stop um, and they'll be they'll be delayed rather than mm-hmm. continue at high speed and crash into each other. And that's as it that's as it should be. What we're not good at, and I'm not criticising this, is just an observation, um, is when mm-hmm. you know someone hacks a hospital um, uh, administration system, not an operating theatre. The operating theatre is working just fine, mm-hmm. but. Who's next in the operating theater? Oh, we don't know because the system's down and, you know, everything gets delayed uh, and so forth. And indeed, you mentioned the German uh, case. I was reading um, mm-hmm. the very good um, Imasoft uh, annual ransomware uh, blog by Brett Callow, and he quotes a paper from mm-hmm. the University of Minnesota Institute of Public Health, where they've done a bunch of studies of U.S. hospitals that suffered ransomware between 2016 and 2021. And they use all these things about, you know, different health outcomes and they look at individual cases and they estimate between 42 and 67 elderly American patients probably died uh, because of um, ransomware mm-hmm. attacks on <clears throat> hospitals. And that's very, very hard. You know, if a, someone in a, of advanced
last year's was already quite ill. You know, to what extent did the delay yeah. trigger their ultimate um, sad passing? You don't quite know. And it takes mm-hmm. us outside of our own area of, of expertise. But clearly, if you mess with healthcare administration, you know, somebody probably suffers at some at some point. The other point is to go back to data. I think the other thing we need to get better at understanding, mm-hmm. although we're starting to get better at this, is the impact of data breaches and that sort of psychological destabilization. Mm-hmm. So thanks to GDPR and all other regulations, we're all used to getting no- notifications saying you've been, you know, your personal data is breached. You know, Troy Hunt in Australia <laughs> has done that marvelous have, you, have I been pwned yep. service so we can all find where our emails are. But, you know, the difference between, mm-hmm. oh, look, I was on LinkedIn in 2012, God help me. Um, so, you know, some old passwords out there on the dark web, fine. I'm not going to lose sleep over that. Compare the seriousness of that, yep. i.e. not very serious, with the Spanish mental health data, which is extraordinarily serious. Um, I think we started off thinking, oh, those are just two data, those are two data breaches. Well, they both are, that's true, yeah. but they're massively not the same. And we need to think about ways in terms of regulation, criminalization, mm-hmm. accountability, but also public reassurance and not reassurance. You know, when, when do you get the public worried and when not? You know, at some point, mm-hmm. I reckon within the next 10 years, and I'm glad this is after my time in government because I wouldn't like to be the first to do it. <laughs> at some point, somebody in public, somebody in a, a position of public authority is going to stand up after what looks like a large scale data breach mm-hmm. and say, look, you know what? I really wish this hadn't happened, but it doesn't really matter. Right. And that will be an important mm-hmm. moment because then when the same person or the same government, whatever, stands up and says, I'm really, really sorry, but this one actually matters and you need to do this, this, this and beware of this and change your bank account, whatever yeah. it is, they will sit up and listen. And we need to get better at difference. So we need to get better at, at all sorts of things. But two things we need to get better at. One is improving the resilience of critical systems that depend on sort of software in the same way as we're quite good at mm-hmm. um, depending at protecting systems, um, you know, hard industrial control systems. That's one thing. And the second thing is getting better at understanding the severity and lack of severity of different types of data breaches. Yeah, no, I completely, I completely agree. One of the things, you know, that uh, I will say is that uh, the classification of things needs to be very, very clear. When we talk about classification, not even just classification of data, but also classification of breach. You know, what action does the victim yeah. need to take? Is it just that this is a data breach and you need to take no action whatsoever because basically it's information that yeah. cannot be abused or it's information that can be abused yeah. and therefore you need to monitor it. You need to be you know, looking and, and, and checking to see if new credentials or new accounts are being created in your, your name. So, you know, having that monitoring side of things, especially around you know, the financial aspect of things. And then there's the, you know, okay, and these are the breaches and you really need to take action. You need to go change your credit card. You need to uh, be aware. You need to make some type of action. So getting into those classification of breaches, I think, is highly critical and important because uh, not all data is equal, as, we, as, as you mentioned. It's not the same. And different breaches can mean different things. Completely, completely with you there. So I'd like, to kind of, I'd like to get a bit more kind of into the, you know, what types of things, what, what types of best practices or what types of things that the National Cybersecurity Center create? You know, how do they get more being more proactive? Because one of the things is, you know, I always say is that uh, for many years, a lot of the agencies were only, you know, listening and, and taking information from the, 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 the private companies and the businesses um, rather than re- turning it around and, and, and sending it back. Uh, what types of proactive things did the center create in order to, what, what initiatives or what programs to really make you know uh, information available for businesses to take action. Well, I think what I remember was you know, it was very fashionable to do all these sort of you know charts with mission statements and so forth. But I remember trying to say that we should be able to we should be able to trace everyone's job in the NCC to some sort of you know useful outcome for the nation, and also we should be able to sort of work out what are the main things we do and we narrowed it into four things not speaking for the current ncsc it's been very ably led by yeah. lindy cameron and other northern Irelander uh for you know four years now um but in my day i think we we focused on four things the first was properly managing incidents so mm-hmm. if you you know mentioned what i we were all over it we were issuing guidance mm-hmm. you know, quicker than any other public authority it was being quoted in the australian parliament and stuff like that which was you know great um so mm-hmm. we were um um if you contrast, say, WannaCry with Talk Talk, which, you know, a major breach in the UK three years previously, where the government said nothing and lots of people were panicking, even though it turned out it wasn't mm-hmm. that serious a breach. Um, 
it was like, if there's a major incident effect in the UK, the NCAC will be all over it and will be all over mm-hmm. managing its impact in the UK. So that was the first thing and that was really, really core. The second was working out and directly uh, helping to protect the most critical things. So a good example of that, you know, Theresa May calls a snap election, general election in 2017. We're aware of what happened in the US and elsewhere in 2016. How do you mobilize at scale very quickly, large scale protection of the electoral system. So that's one example, but then you might do more longer term work. So for example, published a big blog on how we were doing the cyber protection of the new smart meter system, that, that sort of thing, the second thing. The third and fourth are probably the most interesting because they were the more most sort of innovative. So the third was actually, um, and this was fundamentally important to the NCC, it was um, there's a bunch of noise and pollution in the digital environment that nobody's doing anything about. Why is it? So let's take that. that um, it's be- and it's because of economics, because the market doesn't incentivize it. Mm-hmm. So let's take one area where the market does work, threat intelligence. Mm-hmm. The government has a tiny role, in my view, in threat intelligence, because you've got brilliant companies producing mm-hmm. lots of threat intelligence and actually working very well with government. The government occasionally will get a bit that, frankly, the private sector is not allowed to get because of the you know, powers granted to organizations like GCHQ or the NSA or mm-hmm. Cyber Command or DGSE and ONCE in France or whatever it is. And the government can find ways of sharing that. But other than that, the market looks after threat intelligence. Um, brand spoofing. Now there's much more of a market in it, but um, Back when I started, nobody was, very few people were doing brand, um, were doing domain name protection, were using DMARC and so forth. So the government, we said, look, what are the most spoofed brands in the UK? And we came up with, oh, HMRC, the tax authority, HM Revenue and Customs. It's uh, it's our most spoofed brand as far as we can mm-hmm. um, tell. HMRC came up with us and said, Let, let's do a DMARC pilot. We configured the DMARC pilot to not just to stop uh, deliveries of um, impersonation attempts against the HMRC domain, but actually delivery to us so we could count them mm-hmm. and see where they were coming from. We blocked 500 million in one year. So that's 500 million instances <laughs> where a uh, fake email didn't arrive in somebody's inbox and they had to decide, can they trust us or not? We did mm-hmm. automatic takedown requests. So we always knew that if we went to a, a web host and said, look, we think your host has been, uh, your um, mm-hmm. domain has been misused, um, uh, they'd take it down, you know, etc. But doing that manually was only dropping the ocean. Doing it in an automated uh, way meant that we got the average time to die in the UK for a website, malicious website hosted in the country down from 27 hours to 45 minutes. So we started doing stuff like that, so looking at where the market wasn't working and doing mm-hmm. direct interventions, not public-private partnerships or information sharing. Actually, like the government will do this. So that was the third thing. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth thing was actually doing things like um, giving general advice. So instead of just working with the critical sectors and the defence and the national security, Security industry. I think, you know, it's a slight caricature, but if you look at British government cybersecurity mm-hmm. advice from say around 2012, you were saying to, you know, a mid-sized charity or a small chain of florists or whatever it is, uh, you need to you need the cyber defenses of a nation state. And you're like, but we're a <laughs> yes. chain of florists. You know, we can't afford that. So, we, got, we, got one, you know, we got one person um, who's doing uh, IT about 20% of their time. <laughs> so. Exactly. So we gave them things like logging made easy, like, you know, that sort of thing where, you know, you showed them how to do things. Um, uh, we refined password policy. You know, we got a behavioral psychologist to do that groundbreaking study, the brilliant Angela Sassi of UCL, who showed that mm-hmm. current British government password policy based on American policy of 2003 uh, meant that if you followed it and you had 25 accounts, which was the average at the time, uh, then you were asking people <laughs> to remember the equivalent of a 600 digit number that changed every month. <laughs> So you had to, you know, you had to change it. And so we gave simple. And I remember one day, I remember when Mm -hmm. one of my children was uh, at the sort of transfer between primary and secondary school um, age, going around a whole bunch of schools, because that's what you do in this country at that stage in life. Mm -hmm. And um, on several of them, they had NCSC password advice for kids. Um, on the school sort of notice board and I thought yeah that's that's you know that's the impact here and I was like basically here's what you do mm-hmm. and here's how you do it and here's what sort of general internet safety looks like and that was a moment of real I suppose pride that you had had, had, had some mm-hmm. impact so those are the four things incidents critical protection direct interventions and bits of the ecosystem where the market wasn't working and guidance to everybody yep. No, I think that's great. There's, you know, it's 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 because one of the things is that is when we look at cyber attacks and we look at all the things. Majority of a lot of them are opportunistic, uh, but it's, they're not targeting yeah. the critical infrastructure. It's 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 the small businesses out there. It's the individuals, the citizens. 
So if the guidance doesn't apply to everyone, yeah. then you're you're missing a large part of the threat landscape, the threat, you know, the, the targets uh, that attackers go after. So um, absolutely, it's it should be no, it should be cybersecurity for all. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, the Russian state, on the other hand, again, not being nice to uh, the Russians, but they have no history of, you know, that type of, um, you know, commercial espionage attack. However, if you mm -hmm. happen to be representing a bunch of high profile individuals with connections to Russia, then you might want to watch out. You know, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like, um, you know, it, it's important for everybody to assess their own at risk. Um, mm -hmm. Then everyone is at risk for criminal um, sort of ransomware type attacks or or, or yep. data uh, theft attacks, but they're not they're not particularly uh, targeted, and that's where it does get a bit Darwinian. So whilst mm -hmm. you know, uh, I wish you know, um, and uh, we swiftly got over it, but you know, to go back to the story about Ian Levy and his Australia speech, you know, um, <laughs> whilst we joke that perhaps um, we should be more delicate, you know, the idea that you're just trying to outrun a um, another target isn't isn't wrong. You know, you, if you make cyber if you make cyber criminals work harder, they will um, be more likely to leave you alone mm -hmm. and go somewhere else. I think uh, uh, when you're running a, yep. a national center, though, it's really important that you're flexible and adaptable. So one case that stayed with me a lot, um, and it's all seeped mm -hmm. out into the public domain by now, was um, a company called Mammoth Productions, which is now owned by ITV, I believe, mm -hmm. but at the time was independent, small, um, based out of Northern Ireland, um, made documentaries, and it was making a program that apparently provoked the ire of the North Korean state. And... <laughs> um, so the same people, the same people who went for the interview, went to Sony after the yep. interview uh, movie, um, seem to go hunting for um, for them. And I mm -hmm. think that's the government's problem. I don't think you can reasonably expect, you know, a small company, um, yep. you know, with two figures of staff uh, who are doing something that's perfectly permissible, you know, free speech country mm -hmm. make make yep. any documentary you like as long as you're doing so responsibly and within the law, which they absolutely wear. Mm -hmm. And then if a nation state comes after you, it's not their job to take on a nation state on their own. It is their job to protect themselves better from ransomware. It's everybody's mm -hmm. job to protect themselves better from ransomware and other forms of criminality. It's not their job to take on a hostile nation state with, you know, elite cybersecurity powers. That is, that is for the government. Yeah, especially, you know, we're in the world now where basically it's no longer just basically, you know, individuals you know with a you know, specific set of skills but it, we're not into a whole supply chain of cyber criminals and they all specialize and you know especially from you know you've got cyber mercenaries uh you're, you're basically cyber you know uh, you know attackers for hire um that uh, nation states will actually leverage so it's really getting too difficult the yeah, absolute that organizations it's a point that uh yeah you need to do what you can in order to make yourself resilient as much as possible against the most common types of cyber attacks but when the nation state comes after you, and that's really where you start, you, you can't do it. You can't do it alone. And even I say that even countries alone can't do it alone. We all need to work together. We need to make sure that we uh, have less places for you know safe havens for cyber criminals to operate. Um, and the more we work together, the more you know collaborative uh, that we can prevent and, and become resilient to nation state cyber attacks as well. Absolutely. Um, two points on that. One is. You know the safe haven problem for mm -hmm. cyber criminals is massive. It's probably, in my view, the single biggest yep. problem in mainstream cybersecurity today. And there are limits to what we can do there. Um, you know, Russia, the large, physically the mm -hmm. largest country in the world, um, harbors them, and there's no prospect of that ending anytime soon. Yep. So that does mean that you know, I mean, I think sometimes we underestimate just how much that type of cyber crime has changed mm -hmm. policing. You know, I'm not an expert in policing, but when I was being well brought up, you know, my <laughs> idea of the contract between citizen and police was if you were the victim of a crime, the police would A, take you seriously and sympathetically, mm -hmm. and B, go after the criminals. And then cyber crime emanating from Russia, they can't do either of those things. There's too much of it to give individual tailored attention to all but the most serious victims. And secondly, mm -hmm. you can't you go after them in Russia. So, you know, we have it, it. It does to some extent break the model of policing. So we yes. have to, you know, build our defences up. And that brings you me to your other point, Joe, about international mm -hmm. cooperation. And some of that was absolutely fantastic that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I remember during WannaCry, um, having a long call with my then Israeli counterpart Evia Tarmatania mm -hmm. on a Sunday because that's the first day of the working yeah, week in Israel. They started and, working week. <laughs> Exactly. So they were telling us, you know, what to expect and what not to expect, which is hugely helpful. I remember, you know, through all the 
despite all the um, you know shenanigans with Brexit and so forth, um, the relationship with France uh, mm-hmm. was superb and um, uh, improving all the time I was in office. You know, the relationship with the US was phenomenal, and mm-hmm. I don't think we could have done um, anything like uh, what we um, a- achieved uh, without the underlying sort of capabilities of the US, you know, generously Absolutely. given in partnership. So, you know, I think there's so much, you know, we enjoyed um, a good partnership with Estonia and other mm-hmm. um, Baltic and Nordic um, uh, uh, countries. And it was quite an interesting thing. It was so, it was with, with a few uh, sp- sometimes spectacular exceptions, you know, it was very, very apolitical and very informal. It was just a bunch of people sort of clubbing mm-hmm. together. What have you got? What capabilities? What information? Yeah. And <laughs> trying to work it out from there. So I think it was really important as well. I think, you know, as, as you know, the UK was going through the National Cybersecurity Center kind of path and, and really establishing that. And the US really also, you know, started going through with the CISA and uh, with Chris Krebs coming in and, and what they did is also very similar to becoming rather than just a intelligence and, and you know understanding the threats, but also becoming much more proactive and creating best practices and sharing. I think that was a significant, you know, for not just, you know, many countries following that same path. And then of, of course with Gen Easterly continuing that. Uh, one of the questions I'd like to ask you is as well as you know, recently the UK launched the uh, AI guidelines as well, uh, because that's also becoming a big yes. area um, of focus, especially, you know. With generative AI, uh, what's your thoughts around kind of the best practices and the guidelines that come out, um, and also e- EU then followed with the uh, EU AI Act as well? Um, is there anything that you see kind of evolving around that, and what what do you predict you know for the coming year uh, related to those? Well, the easy answer to that is let's have another podcast because <laughs> there's so much to unpack there. I think um, uh, three things um, as briefly as I can. Mm-hmm. Firstly. We need to guard against AI doom mongering. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's you know there are you know having one of the frustrations is having just got um, I think just won the argument against mm-hmm. you know cyber both distorting and infantilizing mm-hmm. the distorted priorities away from the sort of mainstream protection of hospital administration networks, for example, and towards the sort of you know preventing things mm-hmm. like planes falling out of the sky that actually we were probably quite good at. Preventing it yeah, already. Sky, sky um, ha- so sky we need, that's we need... not happening anytime soon. <laughs> so it's not. No, exactly. So <laughs> we need to we need to um, we need to guard against that type of um, uh, doomerism. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't real challenges, which is mm-hmm. why I think actually taking a chunk of the problem, because in, in the age of AI, how you protect against disinformation is different from how you protect against mm-hmm. bias in public services, which is different from how you protect against massive disruption in the labor market, which is different from how you mm-hmm. protect against misuse of AI in military context, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so actually, you know, I think if, if you look at the UK's paper um, on AI um, mm-hmm. uh, risk, you know, it looks at sort of, you know, biochemical weapons as one of the most mm-hmm. serious risks. And I think a lot of people who are more expert than me would agree with that. And it looks at cyber as something to take, to pay attention to. And so I think, mm-hmm. you know, the UK, US and other um, joint uh, paper at the end of 2023 is really good in that respect mm-hmm. because it's sober, balanced, specific, and essentially, you know, I think the key thing with AI and cyber is that um, as as ever, you know, there's a race on between good use and misuse of uh, mm-hmm. technology. And history would suggest that there's some sort of equilibrium, which is that, you know, um, if you can use AI automation for mm-hmm. Bad, you know, if you can get Worm GPT to say write me something evil, you can get good GPT to write you something just as good that will block yeah. it. Maybe after a bit of a time yeah. lag, um, and providing that equilibrium holds, we're okay. But we need to be really, really vigilant about that. So I think that's good. Um, um, so you know, warn against doomerism. Um, good sort of you know international approach in cybersecurity. The EU AI Act. I think, first of all, there's some way to go on this. Um, yes. uh, secondly, you know, I have some sympathy with the, the, the with the skeptics um, about it. You know, I think um, fundamentally, when I t- talk to politicians about cybersecurity, I say, look, first of all, you know, what tone do you want to set on technology? Mm-hmm. Do you want to set the tone that this is an opportunity with some risks to be managed, or potentially catastrophic risk with little upside? So be careful. And I think you know the EU AI Act is a little bit well. You know, where's the innovation coming from? Or regular? Mm-hmm. Are you just going to regulate somebody else's innovation? You know, the 
alleged uh, concerns of the French president, I think, if accurately reported, are ones that I might um, share. Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, it seems to it seems to really go for regulation of research rather than product and services, I think, you know, but again, all this is some way to uh, all this is some way to run and details do matter. So we'll reserve judgment for a while. But I think, you know, some of the skepticism and concern about it being overly regulatory and not focused enough on European uh, innovation yeah. and taking advantages of AI is um, at this stage appears justified and needs addressing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think they, they're taking two very distinct, different approaches, to, uh, but it'll be interesting to see where the convergence eventually comes from both of them. Uh, one thing I did like around the uh, UK's uh, guidelines, which was in cooperation with CISA and, and a few other partners, was around you know really breaking down AI and its components because sometimes we bundle everything up under this massive broad perspective of AI, and really get into really focus around AI agents, about large language models, machine learning. So it really kind of broke it down into much more you know meaningful chunks, um, and really focus around let's let's get a baseline going, and here's some guidelines that you can. Uh, be proactive about, or the EU AIAC was more about you know let's let's kind of uh, restrict and kind of audit and, and get in, into the really focus of uh, what you must be doing, but really not really breaking it down into the simple components of like what the service is ultimately that that, that AI agents doing or algorithms doing it didn't really classify into the intention of the algorithm completely, and I think you know, splitting that down is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I. Uh, um, the great Professor Michael Sulemeyer, um, formerly at Harvard and now in the US mm -hmm. government, um, you know, once said to me, he said, uh, oh, uh, I was saying, this AI stuff, you know, should be a little bit skeptical. He said, oh, absolutely. He said, sometimes when people say to me AI, I go, you mean you means hard sums. Yeah, there is. <laughs> um, so I think probably in the, these days, we'd, all, we'd both say that's going a little bit um, too far. Maybe he wouldn't. I don't claim to mm -hmm. speak for him, but there's... Um, you know, there've been all their experts saying, you know, we wish we'd come up with a different term. You know, um, you know adv <laughs> advanced, Matt, you know, high speed computational mathematics or something. <laughs> but you know, um, but there's so many different applications mm -hmm. of AI that sometimes I think yep. the sheer breadth of the term doesn't help us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think it's it's too broad. We need to kind of simplify it and bring it down to really what what yeah. is the outcomes. Um, I always like I liked when uh, Dark Tangent uh, referred to it as. Uh, uh, predictions, you know, what 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 is the predictions making? <laughs> um, and uh, well, Alex uh, mentioned it as uh, algorithm utilities, which I, I like some of those terms. <laughs> so, Kieran, it's been fantastic having you on, and it's really been for me. It's always educational listening to you and some of the insights that you have and and the journey you've been on. Um, is where, where can people follow you or catch up with you? Or you, know, are you, you mentioned you're doing some writing. What are you writing blogs or are you coming up with your own book at some point? What's, what? Well, uh, so I'm, I'm hanging in there on X at Kieran Martin OXF. Mm -hmm. um, not posting very much. I'm on Mastodon at uh, Infosec uh, Social uh, and using Blue Sky uh, a bit more uh, frequently. <laughs> I My New Year's resolution is to write more, so I write some blogs on the Blavatnik School mm -hmm. of Government uh, website, and I will possibly reactivate my uh, sub stack. But, you know, um, <laughs> please, uh, I will send you my stuff, Joe, and you can um, use your, uh, uh, your, your um, impressive and growing audience mm -hmm. uh, to amplify it. Um, but, yeah, I very much want to try... Um, for various reasons, I didn't write as much in 2023 as I had mm -hmm. done in previous years and would wish to. So that's my New Year's resolution. Um, um, and, you know, we're a bit into 2024 now, and um, I think uh, I'll hope to have some stuff out in the future. Fantastic. It's been fantastic having you on. Always enlightening. And for the audience, uh, it's definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, Congratulations it's, again. Thank you. It's for for me. It's you know, it's a milestone. I never thought I would get to you know, it's almost three years now in the running. and. Uh, um, and, and, and what I enjoy is I get to talk to awesome people like you uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. And that's, yeah. that's for me, the value of the podcast is to, to want to share the, the knowledge, but also to get to, to chats on a, on a frequent basis with amazing thought leaders and industry changers. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. So for the audience, again, you know, it's been fantastic having Karen on. Karen on. Um, tune in every two weeks for the 401 Access Tonight podcast. And uh, look forward to, you know, having more conversations and uh, great uh, insights going forward. Uh, and thank you. Stay safe and take care.